Guys, I have a, a message today that is going to be a continuation of what we spoke about last week. Uh, we were talking about what real greatness looks like. There's a greatness that the world would perceive to be great, and it's about who's the boss, it's about the, pre the prestigious things that you stick on your walls and the titles that you carry. And Jesus comes in the face of this, and he says, in fact, true greatness in the eyes of God is, in fact, the opposite. He says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then you take up a towel and a bowl and you wash people's feet. And he was talking about the wonder of the, the sort of counterintuitive approach to the Christian faith of being a servant. So I want to continue talking about what it means to be good to great. But remember, we're only good because of what Christ has done for us. None of us is good enough on our own. You can do whatever you like. You can go to church every week. You can read your Bible every day. Pray as long as you like. You will never be good enough on your own. There's only one way to be declared good, and that is through the shed blood of Christ. That's the foundation of absolutely everything. But we were looking at, a, at two passages last week, Mark chapter 9 and 10, and Jesus addresses the same, the same theme of servanthood leading to greatness. I want to read the second passage to you today, which you'll find in Mark chapter 9. Uh, Mark chapter 10, sorry, from verse 35 to verse 45. Let me read this to you. Listen to the story. This was a request by two of Jesus' disciples, James and John. Then James and John, verse 35, the sons of Zebedee came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now, when the herd, ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and he said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. Remember that. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's a great passage. I am convinced, and I was just chatting with some folk before church today, that if we could get this right, if we could change our minds about what greatness looks like and apply that greatness into the context of the church we could revolutionize, not the church, not just this community, but the world would be revolutionized if the church understood its role. The trouble is everybody's trying to be the boss. Everybody's trying to tell everybody what to do, and everybody's trying to lay guilt on the others in order for them to achieve what they want to achieve and get what they want. Jesus says, don't worry about that stuff. God will take care of that stuff. You just get on with the job of serving people. Now, this is a tough theme for us in the world today, where we kind of think, well, in order to be somebody, I've got to have a title or a degree behind my name, and apparently Jesus would suggest you don't need that at all. So what I want to do today is have another foundational look and hopefully take us in the direction of where I hope this good to great theme will be leading us in the course of the next number of weeks. Now, the, the aspect that I want to do is, is maybe may a fun aspect, certainly not a frivolous one, but it is a foundational issue for us. So what I want to do is we want you to pretend that you, this is adult Sunday school. And I have nine different principles that I want to take you to and point you to an individual or point you to an, to a, an aspect or an incident that took place in the hopes that something will move from here to here in this issue of being a servant. So we're going to look at some of these individuals, some of these different situations that we find in the Scripture. And I really hope that you will go back and read them, because this is just the prelim. Take this home every day, read that stuff, read it and read it again, 
because the Bible has a way of speaking to you without anybody standing in between. You don't need me. You just need to read your Bible. So I've got my trusty note port over here, and we're looking at the subject of being a servant. So let me just write this in the, in the corner over here. Okay. Now you'll notice in the passage here that there's reference to being a slave as well. Now slaving is less than servanting. Servant. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. You've got a slave over here. Okay. And then I want to suggest another aspect of serving is found in stewardship here. You're also a steward. Now, these three are all taught in Scripture. So I'm hoping to bring these to light by doing a comparison between all three of them, and then you'll get to where we've come from to where we're going, because being a steward of God is the ultimate of what it means to be a servant, because the steward is given something to use on behalf of his master, and that's where we are going to. So I'd like to do it this way. I'm going to do my my notorious noughts and cross thing over here to sort of divide this thing. And I want to give you three of each of these dilemmas that you will face when you are a slave, servant, or a steward. Is that right? Okay, so I hope you can see this on the screen. Now, you know that my pictures are not very good and my writing is awful, but you'll get it in the end. There are three aspects to being a slave. Each one is a type of a liquid. Slaves are all about blood sweat, and tears. You want to be a slave, you've got to understand the shedding of your own blood. You want to be a, a slave, you can understand the issue of sweat. You're going to sweat it out. And, uh, and then you'll understand, too, thirdly, that slaves understand what it is to be in such a position where they're hopeless and there's tears. That's brilliant. Okay, so slaving is all about those three liquids, blood, sweat, and tears. Now, that comes out of the Garden of Eden, when God said that you have sinned, you have separated us from me, yourselves from me, and now as a result of that, you're going to move out of the Garden, you're going to move to east of Eden, you won't be able to come back into the Garden, because there's an angel there, and now you will live your life as a slave to the world, a slave to Slyn, a slave to a whole bunch of things, and the symptoms and the, pre of the prerequisites or the, the things that come out are simply blood, sweat, and tears. Let's look at those very quickly individually. And let me give you my example. There's a great picture of slavery in the children of Israel prior to Moses leading them out of Egypt. And you'll see that all three of these things apply to the children of Israel. First of all, there was a lot of blood being shed in Israel. The little Israelite boys were all, you know, if you were a little guy and you were born as a baby, you were thrown into the Nile River, you were killed, you were run through with a sword, they killed you because you were worth nothing. You were just destined to be a slave. And so when you look at the blood that is being shed, it's because you have no value. Now, Satan is a picture of Pharaoh, or Pharaoh is a picture of Satan, and he has no value. Anybody that will tell you Satan loves you is lying to you, and there is a lie out there that would suggest that. He hates you. He hates you. He wants to shed your innocent blood. And then there's the sweat aspect. And here's the children of Israel in Egypt making bricks. And they made abundant bricks. And they were beaten up because they weren't making enough bricks. And Pharaoh was getting tougher on them. And they were sweating great drops of blood as they were trying to get the, 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 you know, the number of bricks were trying to be made. So the children of Israel in Egypt, prior to them being relieved from Egypt by Moses and through God's intervention, there was a lot of blood being shed in that place. There was a lot of sweat being run out there because they had no had here, they had no value. Here they had no purpose. No purpose. Just get up every day. Same old, same old. So oh, nothing's gonna change around here. Just gotta make bricks. Just keep making bricks. Whether I'm feeling well, whether I'm feeling sick, whether I'm whatever, I just get up and I make bricks. And then lastly, there's this place of tears. A tears is a picture of no hope, no hope at all. So we've got no value, we've got no purpose, and we've got no hope as a slave. But what's interesting is that 
these aspects of slavery as it relates to the nation of Israel are equally applicable as they relate to the issues of our lives. You know, you have a look at our slavery to the law. Moses gave the law to the people. The law was meant to point people toward God, to tell people what God liked and did not like. But the law became bondage, and they became chains to the law. They became slaves to the law. And the scribes and the Pharisees beat them up with their tongues, and they painted verbal pictures and, and led them to more and more guilt. And ultimately, they encuffed them with the, with the chains of slavery to the law. Sometimes we get in slavery to the things around us. Some of us can become enslaved to a, a bad habit, and the habit chains us up. And the habit, it, it stops us from becoming what God wants us to be. And we end up with the same things. We end up with blood, a lot of sweat, and a whole bunch of tears because it leads us to a place of hopelessness. Slavery to sin does exactly that, does it not? It sheds our blood eventually. We die It leaves us with a place of sweating out the same old, same old, trying to be a good person, trying harder to be a better person, and failing every time we sweat it out. And then ultimately we find ourselves in a hopeless situation. There's no hope, and we all know, without God. But then Galatians 5 says this to us. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. For freedom. Jesus knew when he looked at you, he said, you're in bondage. The first thing I need to do is set you free. And so Jesus came and shed his blood to set us free, to release us from the chains of sin, to release us from the bondage to bad habits, to release us from this, the, the, the bondage that we have towards the law and being a better person. And it goes on. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, people, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Now, people, he's talking to Christians here. <laughs> to believers. It's so easy for us to find Christ. It's so easy for us to find redemption through his blood and restore a relationship with him. But over the course of times, those other bad habits, those other thinking patterns start to come back, and we find ourselves moving back into Egypt if you were a children of Israelite person. So we've got to work out that one. The second aspect of this is that there are slave traders. Satan is a master slave trader. And a slave trader is just somebody who offers you something and takes something incredibly precious from you. You know, you have Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan came to them, and he sold them a lie. He said, if you will have this, and you'll have the tree of knowledge of Eden, you're going to be like God. We're never going to be like God. What a lie he proposed to them. And yet they bought it. They sold themselves into slavery because they bought the lie that Satan offered them. See this pattern throughout Scripture? There's Jacob, you know. He's traded his birthright to become a slave to a guilty conscience. He sold something that was so precious, something that and because he was impatient, he couldn't wait for it. He, Satan came to him and said, I'll give it to you now if you'll basically give me your soul and I will make you a slave to a guilty conscience. That's what Jacob did. Judas came along years later, and he traded a friendship with Jesus to, for a 30 pieces of silver. That's not a good trade. And yet the irony thought of it was he thought he got a good bargain here. He didn't get bondage. He got bondage. And so Satan will come and he will offer us different things as he's a master slave trader. And the irony is that we think that we're getting a bargain And instead, all we're doing is playing ourselves into bondage. People, the worldly system, you don't need Satan to do this. The system in which we live offers you that. It'll steal your soul and offer you a lie. And we'll take it. How sad is that? Let's move on to the next line. Let's talk about servants. Here we have three temptations of being a servant. The first temptation of being a servant is to shine. You want to show off to your buddies. You want to show off to everybody. That's a bodybuilder, by the way. He wants to shine. And the next temptation of being a servant is to whine. It's a wine glass. And then the third one is to recline. Shine, whine, 
and recline. There's a guy, and he's sitting with his arms on his chest there, and he's, he's, he's not dead. He's just reclining. Okay. He looks dead, <laughs> but he's just reclining. And so the three temptations of being a servant in this line is to shine, wine, and recline. Now, the shining part is, is uh, you know, we, you, I spoke to you a while back about the moon, how the moon is no glory of its own. But when it reflects the glory of the sun, man, does it look impressive. And the moon is really happy about being who he is. The moon is not threatened by the sun. The moon is happy to play second fiddle to the sun. And the moon is fully aware that I have no glory of my own. I have no worth of my own. I have to wait for the sun to get in position in order to be seen. Now, that's the attitude of a servant. The attitude of a servant is that I'm not going to be a threat to the person I serve. I'm not going to want his job. I'm not going to malign him or backbite him in order to get what he has. I'm going to serve the best that I possibly can. Now, in 2 Samuel 15, we have a tragic story of a civil war. It took place in the family of David, where David's son, Absalom, wanted to take over the kingship. And so you know what he did? This very glamorous-looking man, this man with so much hair, and uh, so much good looks. He went down to the city gates of Jerusalem, and he began to tell everybody what a good guy he was. He went down to the city gates, his father is the king, and he said to the people, if you've got a problem, you can come to me. I'm the son of the king, and I will help you with your problem. I just want to shine. I just want to look really good in your eyes. I just want you to be impressed with me, and when I walk down the road, I want you to say, oh, there's Solomon. There's Absalom, I mean. And, uh, and, and, and he, he just tried to usurp his father's throne. He just wanted to shine. He could have rationalized and said, oh, I just want to help the people. I just want to make their lives better. But that wasn't his motive. His motive was to shine so that he could get the glory taken away. from. And one day he said it. He said to the people, wouldn't it be cool if I were king? Man, I could sort out all your problems, eh? Hey? Wouldn't it be cool if you just let me be king? My dad's getting old in the tooth. He's long in the tooth now. He's not going to last much longer. Just make me the king and I'll solve all your problems. And so the civil war in the house of David began to get worse and worse and worse and ended literally in Absalom dying. Now, being a servant, the temptation is to shine. Everybody wants everybody to say nice things about them. And that's the first temptation. The second temptation is that of wine. Now, you think I've drawn a wine glass. I'm not talking about that kind of wine. I'm talking about grumbling. I'm talking about moaning. And we whine about this, and we whine about that. I don't know about you, but I'm not into whiners. And I share this in common with God, because apparently God's not into whiners either. Your example here would be the children of Israel, and uh, where the children of Israel were drinking out of their own cup of self-pity. They were in the wilderness, and they were whining. They didn't have meat they were whining because it was hot, and they had to wait. To, they were whining because they had to trust God for water. They were whining because it was hot and dry. And they said, Moses, we just want to go back. Moses, take us back to Egypt. At least we had meat to eat. They had forgotten all the incredibly spectacular things that God had done on their behalf. Bring them across the Red Sea, miraculously providing water, manna from heaven. And yet they still continued to whine. If you're a whiner, people, just stop it. Stop whining. You'll drink it out of your own cup of self-pity. And as a servant of God, we should be drinking out of the cup that is overflowing with bountifulness, like Psalm 23 talks about, overflowing to the people around us. And yet we're whining and drinking out of the cup of self-pity. And I have to tell you, God is not into that. Numbers 21, they grumbled. So God sent snakes amongst them. Now, those of you who know a little bit about alcohol, um, know the effect that it can have on us. And if you drink too much, what happens to you? You kind of lose your senses a little bit, and certain symptoms begin to happen. You begin to, when, they, when, you, when you stop for the breathalyzer test, you've had too much, they, they make you walk in a straight line. But you can't walk in it, you walk in circles. Mm, I would, that's like the children of Israel. They were so drunk on their wine of self-pity that they were drunk with it, they just walked in circles, round and round Mount Sinai. And the longer they whined, the more they walked, and they never, ever received the blessing of what God had promised them because they were whiners, and they were drunk at the point of their own self-pity. You say stupid things. You know, drunk people, man, 
Nothing more frustrating than having a conversation with a drunk oak. You know? And he's whining. And I'm thinking, shut up, man. You know? You know, that's what alcohol does to people, man. It makes you say really stupid things. And then you do stupid things. You drive your car and you're drunk and you've had too much to drink and you get yourself into all sorts of trouble. You, you do the stupidest things. And I don't want to lay guilt on anybody, but I've got to tell you, people, the problem is not you. The problem is, is the habit that you have developed. You need to own this thing. And drinking out of the wine is self-pity. And then to crown it all, you wake up with a headache. Never understand that. No, 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 no. You've got no money. You know, you've got no common sense, so you drink and you do that. And the next day you wake up with a headache. Well, the children of Israel woke up with something more than a headache. When they woke up in the morning after they had wine, there were snakes out there. They didn't just give them a headache, but kill them. And, and we see a picture here of the children of Israel being the epitome of shining, whining. And then David is the great picture of somebody who reclined. In David's life, King David, the great king who served so beautifully and who, who beat Goliath and made a great kingdom for himself. It says in, the, in, uh, in 2 Samuel 11, verse 1 and 2, it says this of David says he stayed at home. It was the season for war, it says. Go read it. They had seasons for everything in those days. So if you're going to fight with somebody, it was the season for war, it says, when the kings would all go out and fight with each other. But David sent his, his general out instead of him, and he stayed at home. And in the very same breath, it says, and one night David is out on the rooftop, and he sees Bathsheba. He should have been out fighting, but he was too busy reclining at home. And when he reclined, he fell, fell into sin and a whole lot of horrible things of uh, walked in, walking in circles and saying stupid things and doing stupid things, waking up with something more than a headache. David crossed that line and sin came into his camp. People, shine, wine, and recline. Let me say something a little bit more about recline. Proverbs has something to say to people who just want to park off. It says, he who works his land will have abundant food. But he who chooses fantasies lacks good judgment. But my favorite one is Proverbs chapter 6. If you have your Bible, turn to it quickly. It's a great passage. Go and read this. Proverbs chapter 6. Um, he's talking about the ant. He says, go to the ant, you sluggard or you lazy person. Consider its ways and be wise. It is no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. There is no place in our spiritual lives to shine, whine, and recline. In order to be a servant of God, that's what it looks like. And then the last one, let's talk about what it means to be a steward. Now, this is probably the, the most encouraging part of this thing. The stewards, these guys uh, had three temptations. These guys have got three resources. Because a steward is not a slave. A steward is not somebody who's not told what to do or else I'm going to beat you. He's not a servant necessarily in the sense that he's, he serves his mind. He's a steward. His master trusts him so much that he gives him stuff. And he says, go and invest this for my purpose. Go and invest this for my kingdom. And I'm going to give you talents. I'm going to give you time. And I'm going to give you treasure in order for you to do that. And so the three things that we have here for these guys is time. There's a beginning and there's an end of your life. This is called time. We all have it. Then we have this guy's singing. I was going to try to draw a picture of Lizanne, but I didn't dare. It would, okay, and he's, he's got talent, man. Lizzie, you want this dude in your worship team, man. He's, he's got talent. And God gives us time. He gives us talent. And then he gives us treasure. And just for this, I'll put a big R standing for Ran. Okay, it's only one of the treasures, but it's a good picture anyway. So the servant is given these warnings about shine, wine, recline. The steward, however, has passed the test of servanthood. 
He's passed the test. And now he's no longer that sense of a servant. He is a steward where he's got time, he's got talent, and God has given to him great treasure. Let's talk about time for a moment. The greatest resource you have is not your, your money, it's your time. Therefore, spend it well. We all spend it somehow um, because you all spend it. In fact, we talk about saving time. You can't save time because even when you're doing stupid things, the clock is ticking. You do know that. You can't save time. We spend time, do we not? And the question we have to ask at the end of the day is what do we spend it on? Now, I appeal to the teenagers. You are watching from the chapel next door over here. I appeal to you guys to get real over the internet stuff and the web page and the that's whatever, you know, that, that thing that you have in your hand. You know, you know you're in trouble when it's the last thing you do at night is turn it off and the first thing you do it in the morning is turn it on. Tell me you're not doing that, kids. You're in trouble if you are. That's a waste of your time. And if he, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes 3, it says there's a time for every purpose under heaven. And as I read that list, I don't see in those purpose under heaven, there's a time and a purpose to sit for hours on your cell phone. I don't find it in there. It's not in that passage. Because it is a waste of a lot of your time, of your energy. And then you get up in the morning and you can't function because you're tired and you've been sitting at night and watching stuff, whatever you watch, I don't know. But people just learn to manage it. The craziest thing about, about this uh, information area in which we live is it's the greatest of everything, but if you don't know how to control it, it becomes the worst thing in your life. I don't hate it for hating its sake. I just hate it because I see you don't have to counsel people like I do. And I see what happens to people who get hooked on that stuff. It's a simple, simple truth. So let's be careful how we manage our time. It's not the only thing. There's other things that we become obsessed with. Some of you men work too long. You work far too long. That's a waste of relational building time that you could have with your friends and with your family. I'm probably a product of that one as well. The Bible talks in Ephesians 5 verse 16 about it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know what redeeming means? It means taking it back. God redeems us. He takes us back from the claws of Satan. He takes us back from the stepping over into that place of hell. He takes us back. He redeems us. And the term is identical when it talks about time. Take it back. Take it back, people. You own your time. It's all you have. So please, I appeal to you. You know, Satan is a thief. And if he can steal your joy and your peace, he can steal your time as well. And the problem is you'll only know it when you get to my age. How much time you have wasted. So we have, we have we stewards of time that God has given us. And then we choose of the talent that God has given to us as well. Now, the interesting thing is that there's a difference between your talents and your spiritual gifts. A talent is something that God has given to you, and you can use it to make a living. You can use it to, to do well in life. That's okay. A spiritual gift, however, is something that God supernaturally gives to you in order for you to be a blessing to the body. But it does not mean that you do not use your talent in order to build a body as well. Because there are times when God may need your talent, where God may say, you have this most amazing talent to do this or that or the next thing. Can you use your talent to help me build a kingdom? Now, it's a beautiful picture of this. As we read it in Exodus 35, where the tabernacle had to be built under Moses. So Moses asked the people to donate stuff to build the tabernacle that God has given them the, the, the plan for. And the people gave abundantly into this thing. And then God appointed two men, two men who were talented. They did this as a job. He said, I'm going to supernaturally empower and enhance your talent so that you can teach others to be crafters, to be carvers, to be people who are going to make the beautiful things that I need to have in my tabernacle. And I'm going to ask you to use your talent to build my tabernacle. So you must understand, people, you've all got a talent. Some have got more obvious talents than others, but you all have one. And God says, I've given that to you for you to use, to enjoy life, to make a living out of whatever you need to do. Use it. Use it well. But when I want your talent, I'm going to ask you for it. And I expect you to say, Lord, if you want me to do that with my talent, I will happily do that. But then we have the spiritual gifts thing. 
I, I would really would love you to go home and read 1 Corinthians 12. It's just before the passage on love, because you can have all of those gifts and have love, and you've got nothing. So read the two together. But it talks about the spiritual gifts that God gives to us, the gifts that make the church function. And when the church is not functioning, there's only one reason it's not functioning, is because you're not using your gifts. And he reminds it to being like a body. He's imagine, you know, the hand and the eye and the ear and the foot and the pancreas and the gallbladder and all those things. And if they don't function, then the whole body, you know, doesn't function. So the onus is upon us, guys, to use your talent when God needs it, offer it to him. Say, Lord, I've have, you've given me this special ability genetically. I've got DNAs that you put together. I have this talent, and I want to offer it to you. I put it on the altar. Whenever you need it, you can ask for it. But, Lord, as far as your spiritual gift goes, I promise to use that not for my own good or my own glory, but for the betterment of the church. Now, here's the deal. Every one of you has a talent. Every one of you. Every one of you, if you're a believer, has a spiritual gift, maybe even more than one. And God sits and he says, I wonder what he's going to do with what I have given him or her. God is watching, just like the talent or the, the parable we often use about the good and faithful servant, three servants, one of them, two of them used it well, and God applauded them, said, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, you have used well what I have given to you. You have stewarded well the gift that I have given. And then the last thing is over here is the issue of our treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. These are the three resources that God has given to you. Here's the three liquids, first of all. Remember, in slavery, blood, sweat, and tears. Here's the three temptations of being a servant. Shine, wine, and recline. And the three issues of what God has given to you, time, talent, and treasure. What do you use your treasure for? Jesus says you can tell where your heart is by where you spend your treasure. Oh, Jesus said that, I don't. He says where a person spends his treasure is a place where his heart quite obviously is. And then Jesus proceeds to give warnings about this. He talks about that rich farmer and the selfishness of his life. And the rich farmer who, who had a great harvest, and he said, I will break down my barns, and I will build the bigger ones, and I will put my thing in there, and I will sit back. He was an eye specialist, this guy. It was all about him. It was all about him. And everything related to me. And God said, that's a waste. And he said to him, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. And he said, I will break, I will build, I will store, I will live, I'll eat, drink, and be merry. And he thinks he wins. But he loses. You know, one of the reasons why he loses is because he loses because he goes alone. You see, if God has blessed you with that, it's a community blessing for the other people as well. It should be. And I'm so grateful for the amazingly community-minded, generous people that I know that God has given to them the ability to make money, the ability to do well in life. And I'm so grateful that we sit here today and in Genesis as a as a result of the generosity of people who have got the gift of generosity. They're the most selfless people that you will know. And their passion is not about building their, their kingdom. Their passion is about building the kingdom of God by using their talents, their time, and their treasure. So I really hope that you will use all three of those things. But there's a, a beautiful story that I just want to end with over here. You see... We mustn't relegate our treasure just to matters financial. That would be, a, that would be a, a travesty if we were to do that. We need to take this and say, well, God has given me more than just financial treasure, if he has. But uh, he's given you your life, your life to spend for him. And you may, some of you may be saying, well, you know, um, I, I don't have the means to be able to do what you're talk, talking about, Trevor. But you do have the same mission to use who you are. I love the story, and I quoted it a while back, about a kid called Johnny. They called him Johnny the Bagger. And Johnny used to stand at the end of the counter in a supermarket, and he would bag things. He was 19 years old, and he was a Down syndrome kid. And Johnny went to church one day, and he heard a sermon all about adding value and making a difference. And so what he did was this. 
He went home to his dad and he said, hey, dad, the preacher today spoke about making a difference. What difference can I possibly make? And so his dad and him sat and they brainstormed this idea. Every night, Johnny would get back from work, from packing the, the packets, and he would sit at night and he would write out little motivational statements. And then he would chop them up. And he would, the next day, he would go and he would meet the person who was coming down the aisle bag his thing is nicely, and then he would take one of his little missional statements, and he would say to the person, thank you so much for shopping here today. I've put a great little saying in your bag, and I hope it helps you to have a great day. And he, this kid did this for a couple of weeks. All of a sudden, he noticed that his line was much longer than anybody else's. And the people were coming to the shop, the true story, to get this kid's sayings. That the other tellers are saying, so what's wrong with us? Why did they all look where Johnny the beggar was? Because they all wanted his little statement. One woman came and said, I've collected them all. I used to come to the shop once a week. Now I come every day. And my fridge is full of all his little sayings. And he's making a difference, people. He's not making a difference because he's got money. He's using himself to be able to make a difference in the world around him. That's great stewardship of who you are. The greatest gift you could give to the world and the people around you is not your money, but is who you are. And I hope that as we journey into now this uh, course that we're going to be taking um, on being a servant leader, being a servant, that it will be a blessing to you as well. So, quick recap. Slaves, blood, sweat, and tears. You know, servants, shine, wine, recline. Grade three temptations and the three resources that God has given to you to be a steward is time, talent, and treasure. You got it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, I wish we could carry on, but our time is gone. There's so much we could say on this. But Lord, we're just trying to establish a foundation of what a servant of God looks like. We're not slaves. Certainly not slaves. You came to release us from the bondage of Satan the lies that he has sold us and we stupidly have bought his lie. And we find ourselves in bondage to sin and to the law and to, to all sorts of other things that you have given and come as the bondage breaker and you've redeemed us from that. We are no longer slaves. You have also, Lord, you have given to us the privilege of servanting. And you've taken this great privilege of being a servant and you have established for us how not to mess up. For those who just want to shine so that the world can have a look and say, oh, what a good guy or good girl he is or she is. To whine, to drink out of our own cup of misery is going to lead us to pain. And then to recline and think, I'll just leave it to somebody else. Thank you, Lord, too, that we can be stewards of what you have given us. You've given us time. And we all have the same, same 24 hours in a day. Some of us will have more 24 hours in a day than others, but we still get 24 hours every day. Exactly the same. I pray we learn to steward our time well, to use it well, not to waste it on things that have no purpose. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as we, as we look at the situation that we're in. We're so inclined to whine about things, whine about this, whine about the country, and whine about... And, and Lord, your, your head must shake sometimes and say... Stop whining. Just serve the way that you're meant to. And for those of us who you have given great treasure to from a financial point of view, we're so grateful, and we're so grateful for people who are willing to let go of that treasure to be a blessing to others. But Lord, you have each one of us has given us, you've given us a life. It's not about rands and cents. It's about giving my life to be pouring out on behalf of others. Help us to be creative in this endeavor. Go with us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.